let's go ahead and get started. Um, so uh, really quick, I wanted to just do a quick introduction of myself. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yes, yeah. ma'am. Wait, where did my presentation go? There we go. All righty. So, um, give me just a second here. So, um, this is the Middle Eastern Garb Overview. Um, my name is Banthane Sabia Al Nadia. Um, I am a pelican um, who was a COVID transplant. I moved in the middle of the pandemic to get away from Arizona. <laughs> Um, and uh, I was elevated to the Pelican in Aitenfeld. Um, Banthane um, is actually the title bestowed on former landed baronesses. So um, I was actually a landed baroness of Tariskathir in Aitenfeld. Um, so just wanted to introduce myself. I have been um, in the SCA for um, approximately 24 years. I actually did the math last night and was shocked. Um, and pretty much that whole time, uh, barring, you know, a couple of sojourns into uh, Roman just after my pregnancy um, and uh, Viking, just to, you know, play around with it, I've been a Middle Eastern persona that whole time. Um, I had started out doing Persian for quite some time um, and uh, realized that I did not have the right figure for Persian, but I absolutely had the right curvy figure for Turkish. Um, so about uh, seven years ago, I made the switch to Turkish. Um, so I'm going to dive right in. Um, this is my um, my blog. Um, the, it's linked in the presentation, which I will be sending out to out everyone when we're done, um, which will also be available on the Royal um, Outlands Inter, Inter Kingdom University website. I always I would stumble over that mouthful. Um, so I have a tendency to blather. Um, so if at any point you have a question, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question right then. You do not have to wait until the end. I am happy to answer questions as we're rolling through, especially because this presentation is going to be chock a block full of pictures um, that I really want people to be able to ask the questions about when they're looking at them. So moving right along, what we're going to cover today um, is Persian garb as well as Turkish garb. I'm going to focus on Safavid Persian, which is a 1501 to 1722, a little outside of period, but um, it's important to kind of look at some of that later period stuff for Persian especially. Um, because there's a lot of conjecture that needs to be made as there are not a lot of extant pieces um, as in garments. Um, a lot of the uh, Safavid Persian stuff is, is based off of looking at miniatures. So um, we're also going to focus on um, Ottoman Turkish. Um, and Ottoman Turkey um, had multiple sultans. So um, I'm going to cover 1301 to 1922. Again, um, slightly outside of period, but um, a large amount of Middle Eastern arts in general, including garments, really did not change all that much um, throughout the throughout the time period. So, looking at some of those later period examples, clearly not the 1900s, um, but looking at some of those later period examples, I think is beneficial. Um, something I want you guys to know about me. I am not a perfectionist. I love Middle Eastern garb and Middle Eastern accessories and just the whole sumptuous vibe, right? But I'm also the person who has um, a multitude of crossover tide coats that are Mongolian style for my underlayer because um, my weight would fluctuate so much that I really wanted garb that was going to be accessible to me at any time. So I'm the person who um, I very much support do what makes you comfortable and it still, you know, gives you that kind of look and vibe. So we're also going to look at the differences between male and female garments. And moving right along, some housekeeping notes. Um, I've done my best to include examples of all of the period items in, in the form of extant pieces when I can find them or miniatures um, and pieces that have been recreated for SCA use. 
And before I go on, does everybody know what I'm talking about when I say miniatures? Does anybody have a question about that? Okay, good. I see a lot of head nodding. Yay! Um, all of the excellent pieces and miniatures presented are from primary sources, um, museums, books, excellent garments that were actually still um, still around. Um, most of, again, most of the Safavid Persian garments um, can only be found just outside of period. Um, and patterning and fit conjecture can be made using those as well as how they're presented in the miniature painting. Um, I will include patterns at the end of the presentation for anyone who actually wants to walk away from this class and make their own um, Middle Eastern garb. And I will also include information on vendors that I trust implicitly. And after 24 years in the SCA, I can tell you that I've got some very strict ideas about what a vendor should and shouldn't be and what kind of garments I'm going to wear. So um, hopefully you guys will take that and, and run with it. So fabrics. Um, as you can see, I'm kind of trying throughout the whole of this presentation to break things up in both Persian and Ottoman, but keeping them separate so that you can clearly tell the differences. These ones up top are Persian, um, and these ones down in the bottom are Ottoman. The fabrics that you would find um, consistently were things like silk brocade, silk velvet, um, silk shantung, um, raw silk, wool, lots of wool, um, some really high quality cottons and linens um, that were used for the skin layer, um, you know, to try to preserve some of those silks and, and higher quality fabrics. Um, I, um, you, you want to try to use silks as often as possible. Um, they're the most easily documentable fabrics available to date. However, um, we need to be comfortable in the SBA. And there are some events and some, you know, garments that, you know, putting it in silk is not something that's going to be super comfortable. A lot of us wear linen consistently, case in point, linen, um, because it's comfortable in a variety of different um, weathers, event types. You know, you can run around and not be concerned about destroying it. Um, so I'm a huge fan of field guard but also a huge fan of silk for court garb. If you're just going to like um, a coronation, by all means, bring out the bling. So there are several differences between Persian and Turkish. Um, when you look at Persian garments, they have an extremely straight shape. I remember I mentioned how I had changed my persona because I was doing Persian for the longest time and I am not a straight girl. I am very, very, very curvy. Um, they, the Persian garments were very loose on the body. They were generally compri comprised of small floral or um, like what I almost call recreation miniature fabrics, like those ones that you've just previously saw um, with, uh, this is uh, a very famous fabric called the Prisoner. Um, and you can see that there are um, seams played out in the fabrics that is also very common. Um, you will also see a lot of vine work, um, small vine work in the Persian garments. Turkish, on the other hand, our um, garments are bell-shaped. Um, they actually have these very wide um, hip gores, especially in the female garments, that literally come out um, from, the, from the coat itself. Um, they're close fitting. They have um, the fabric has very large patterns. I mean, normally when you see, when you're looking at Ottoman, literally the best way I can describe it to people is you're thinking you want to be a couch. Um, you're looking for those huge patterns. Glad I could make you laugh, Tariq. Um, and geometrics were also very, very, very common um, in Ottoman Turkish fabric. So we're going to go from the skin layer out for all of these garments. Um, these three over here on the side are extant pieces. These are shalvar, um, which are your pant layer. Um, I mean, you can see there's a different, there's a couple of different varieties of fabric in here. There's a couple of, like, this is a, a really nice silk. This is a silk brocade. And then I'm fairly certain that these ones are a cotton. I can't remember right off the top of my head. But you can tell that there was a variety of different fabrics utilized, even on the skin layer. Um, so, um, 
one of the coolest pairs of shawar I have ever seen in 20 years of Middle Eastern clothes research is this pair right here. Um, you can see, and hopefully you guys can see, I can zoom in if you need me to, um, but these are this really cool pair of, um, if I remember correctly, this one is Ottoman Turkish, um, pair of shawar that are literally like this big block of fabric and then this bunch of striped fabrics. And they're very colorful, very patterned. Um, and one of the things that I always found really fascinating about this pair of pants is that they, it, it, it really looks like someone was trying to utilize the fabric in the best way possible. Like they had just this tiny little bit of this white fabric up here at the top left. And then they found this really incredible striped fabric or even better, they might have actually stitched all of these stripes together out of different fabric remnants to make use of costly fabric. Um, this up here is a pair of um, cloth of gold shalwar that I um, previously made for um, a uh, Royal of Aitenfeld. And um, uh, you can see that I've cuffed them there at the bottom. Um, that I do uh, mostly, I, I, I've very rarely seen cuffed shalwar. Um, but from an SCA standpoint, I find that having our shalvar cuffed, um, if you're wearing slippers, is makes them more comfortable for the wearer. They're not, you know, shuffling around with these baggy pants at their at their feet, right? And again, you still have that look, but you've got the comfort from cuffs. So we're going to look at Persian first. I'm sorry, can I, can I ask a question real quick? Uh, Absolutely. If you back, um, on the, the red ones, mm -hmm. what I've seen of those, I don't know, you may mm -hmm. have better data, but I usually find them uh, billed as Mamluk. So oh, might, really? It might be a little bit early, but again, that, that may, your, your data may be better than, than what I've had. Um, it's this one, I... I, I I, I can't remember, like right off the top of my head, I would need to go back to my research, but the the, uh, the patterning app absolutely looks correct from a from from that date, right? It definitely looks correct for a man look period. So definitely very well could be. So, I mean, the shape is, you can see very, I mean, not very different, but significantly different in the later period examples. So. Really, there's there's overlap anyway, and and even the mm -hmm. Lamluks are only about fifty years. They even started only about fifty years before the period you're talking about, anyway. So yep, yep. And that's one of the best parts about Middle Eastern garb, I think, is that you know you have such longevity of effectively the same patterns and the same garments, and you can really take things that are outside of period, um, and even like as early as you can get, and the garments are so very similar, right? There's very little changes that happen because they utilize fabrics in the most efficient ways, um, as you can see from that pair of pants. All right, moving right along. So um, this is a, uh, uh, this is the miniature called the Seated Princess over here. I cannot remember the name of this one, but this is a, um, a prince, if I remember correctly. Um, so I wanted to show both male and female um, figures at the beginnings of my uh, presentations for each culture. So um, Persian garment names. Um, I'm gonna go into um, the differences between men and women's gar garments, which are negligible for Persian. Um, everybody start, starts with shawar, whether you're Turkish or Persian or, or, or like any of the Indian, I mean, anything around that area, everything, all of the pants were called shawar. Um, and so if you say shawar, you can use a wide breadth of different um, types of pants patterns. Um, then you go into the pirhan, um, which is the chemise or skin layer. It should be white, off-white, cream, yellow, black, or red, and be made of linen or cotton. Now I'm gonna stop for a second and I'm gonna talk about the color black. The color black, um, there is some conjecture about the color black being kind of um, only utilized for mourning or for religious um, purposes. So, you know, some people, if they're really, really into Middle Eastern, may give you black if you wear black. 
clearly I don't care. <laughs> but, um, you know, just kind of keep, keep, keep that in mind. You know, I love the color black, but I try not to use it as often in my Middle Eastern garb um, because you really want it to be, um, there, almost all of the um, Middle Eastern um, cultures, bright colors were a huge thing. Um, so moving on to the undercoat layer, um, there are several different names that you will find for the various um, layers of garments in both Persian and Ottoman. So if I do not have the term that you're familiar with, don't necessarily think that, um, that you are incorrect. There are a myriad of terms for all of the different layers. Um, the katibi or zirikaba um, is the undercoat layer. Then you have the ruikaba, which is the grand coat. And for headwear, um, you can see the chaharkad, um, which is a square cloth placed on the crown of the head. And it's um, fastened like in place with either a ribbon of silk or it, you can see it, a chin strap of pearls that comes underneath it. Um, you'll also see diadems, very, very common um, for um, women after 1625. Um, but you can see um, uh, so many different examples of diadems with little tiny veils or even just a, a diadem like I mean, you've got ones that are like this big and you've got ones that go this back, this far. And then of course you've got Taj Kulaz, which are the royal cap. It's a small crown that's attached to a cap that goes all the way around the head. There's a variety of different headwear. So the Pirahan, um, these two right here are, um, are modern examples of the Pirahan. And this is the, um, this is one of the most beautiful um, accent pieces available for Persian garments. Um, the embroidery on this is amazing if you ever get a chance to look at it. Um, the katibi, um, the rikaba, the undercoat. Um, as you can see from the miniatures, some really super bright colors. Um, you know, clashing colors is a huge thing, slightly coordinating clashing colors, but clashing colors nonetheless. Um, and then, um, again, I try really hard to give you period examples, as well as um, current SAA examples of what you're looking at. And again, you can see from both of these garments, they're very straight bodied um, and very, very loose fitted. They're not super tight to the body. Oh, the grand coat. This is where the bling comes out. Um, there are some really gorgeous examples of grand coats um, for the Persian um, persona. Um, all you have to do is just dig through miniatures and you can find some really incredible, beautiful garments to inspire you to make um, some really pretty court guard for yourself. Um, clearly you can see, um, uh, this is uh, Edric and Faiza from Kaid. Um, they reigned multiple times, and uh, Faiza is a very well-known Middle Eastern persona um, throughout the SEA. Um, one of the reasons that I specifically wanted to capture um, these um, Rui Kavas is because of the way that um, the uh, clothier utilized fabric to recreate the cloud color. Um, it, it's one of the smartest things I've ever seen done in the SEA because period cloud collars are actually like full of embroidery and take like eons to create. Um, but I've seen multiple people um, just utilize really incredible fabric to recreate the look of the cloud collar without actually having to do the, you know, inane amount of work. Um, so, and then, um, oh, why can't I remember her name? This is a, She's a laurel out of Kaid, and she's incredible, and her name is escaping me right now. Um, but you can see just how gorgeous this Rui Kaba is that she has over the top of all of these variety of layers that she's wearing. Um, I just love the way that this one looks, especially when it's, you know, built on top of this glorious foundation of all of the different layers that she utilized. Headwear. So, um, the Chahara Cod that we talked about, um, there are a variety of examples um, available in miniatures, but you can see there's a couple of different ways to, to wear the Chahara. 
this is one of those words that you stumble over because it's Chahara Kad. Um, and it does not roll off the tongue bone. So, you know, it's just, you can be as simple as just, you know, a triangle of fabric and a little spray of flowers, or you can go as elaborate as, you know, this piece right here has, you know, it's got trim along the edge. She's got a, an embroidered headband. You know, there's, there's so many different things that you can do with this. Alrighty, and then, you know, we've got the couple of diadems. Um, as you can see, um, men in, um, in the Persian Middle East also had a variety of um, headwear available to them. They did not have as much as the Ottomans. Dear Lord, the Ottomans had innumerable um, amounts of headwear for their men. Um, but uh, often you would see men in um, Tashkalaz like this or in um, the very, very specific Persian stylized turban. Um, I cannot remember the name of the, the scientific term coming, huji, that comes out of the middle of the Persian turban. Um, but that actually is one of the, the key differences between Ottoman turbans and Persian turbans, is they actually kind of almost like swoop in to um, that foundational, um, I think it's a hat, I have never actually researched that specific um, foundational piece to the Persian um, male turban. So um, again, I've given you a bunch of um, modern examples, um, a couple of different uh, diadems and Taj claws and different ways to wear turbans. Um, obviously everybody knows the other Sevilla. Um, she um, fairly often wears um, the, per the Persian Shahara Khad. Um, she she made a fashion out of it, I have to say, um, and just a variety of different ways to wear it. I mean, you can see like you can have the the points down near your face. You can you know wrap it behind. There's so many different ways to wear it. So moving on to Turkish garments. Um, once again, we have shalwar, and then we go into the kameez or gomlek, which is the chemise or skin layer garment. Again, should be white, off-white, cream, yellow, black, or red, and be made of linen or cotton. Um, then you've got the hirka, which is a fitted jacket, jacket which can be sleeveless, which is really cool. Um, uh, you can have long, tight sleeves, or you can have wide, short sleeves. You've got the yelek, um, which is a jacket that's worn over um, the antari, um, which is often lined with fur. Um, it's a it's a warmer garment, but not as warm as the farashe, which we'll get to. Um, the antari is the undercoat, which is very similar to the herka, but it's floor length. The herka um, is usually not always, but often you'll find that it's um, right about mid thigh length, um, or you know sometimes you'll see it to the knees, but that's not not as commonly referenced as the mid thigh. And then you have the farashe, which I'm going to invest in one moving out here because I'm pretty sure I'm going to need it. It's an overcoat for um, outdoor use. Um, it's very often very dark colored, um, very, very um, thick wool, um, and it buttons all the way up to the throat. So getting into some Turkish garments here. Um, this is just kind of the general overview. Um, if anybody has any questions about any of the garments that you see here, please let me know, but I want to dig into the um, individual examples. So moving right along, the kameez or gomlek, which is the underlayer. Um, these two are um, uh, modern examples. And then once again, you have the accent piece. Um, anybody who's a Middle Eastern persona, I don't care if you're Persian or Turkish, if you ever get the chance to go to Turkey and go to Top Copy Palace, I cannot suggest it highly enough. So the herka is that um, you know shorter coat that we were talking about, and you can see there's a variety of different ways to wear it: sleeveless, um, long sleeves that attach or detach, um, you know, uh, elbow length sleeves, tight long sleeves. I mean, there's so many different ways to wear it. This is the extant piece um, with a miniature and a variety of um, current modern examples. Um, 
created in the FDA. <laughs> the Yelek, um, once again, a warmer garment, but not necessarily as warm as the Farache. Um, you can see that um, you can have it floor length, um, as these two examples are, and of course, um, you know, all of this is extant, um, or, you know, it can be, you know, mid-thigh length. So, um, almost all of these are modern examples of um, the Antari. Um, this is that, you know, um, it, it's the it's your mid-layer coat, right? But also in Turkish, they basically just have a variety of layers of Antari. So, I mean, you can go as high as like, I've seen six different layers of, of garments from the skin layer out in Ottoman clothing. I don't really necessarily think it would be comfortable for us, um, but you know, you can get as sumptuous as you want. The Antari were built on top of each other. So you can see people wearing, you know, different layers of it. This piece right here is, um, again, one of the top Copy Palace extant pieces. Um, one of my favorites, it's gorgeous. Um, and then we've got a couple of different modern variations on, on the, the Antari. And once again, we're at the Farache. Um, that is that warm woolen garment that we talked about that buttons all the way up to the neck. Um, and you can see there's, um, this is a period example over here, as well as a period illumination. And then um, uh, Mr. Safaya out of On Tier, who unfortunately has not been playing um, very much these last couple of years, um, has just an incredible um, variety of different uh, Middle Eastern projects that she did. And uh, recreating the period Barache was one of them. Here's one of the best parts. Pocket. There are pockets in the Farache, and it's the most amazing thing ever for anybody who wants pockets in their FDA clothing. Here you go. So I'm going to start with female headgear, and then I'm going to move on to male headgear. Um, so uh, uh, I cannot remember the name of this um, piece right here, but again, this is Mr. Safaya, and she actually did the uh, the netted veil um, eye veil. Um, God, there's an important, I cannot recall it right now. I should have put it in my notes. I apologize. Um, there's a variety of different veiling techniques that you can utilize. Again, we talked about how, you know, we've got the ability to mask as, um, mask very easily as Middle Eastern persona. Um, there is the traditional pill box with or without veil can be found. Um, you've got your Fez style. Thank you very much, Tariq, for modeling. Um, also myself, right? There's a variety of different shapes for the Fez styles as well. I mean, you can find ones, clearly um, Tariq's is taller than mine. Um, they can go as tall as like way up to here. Um, they can be rounded top, they can be dome topped. I mean, there's um, dome as an onion dome topped. I've seen that. Um, there's so many different varieties of them. It's not even funny. So if you see um, a uh, pillbox or Fez type structure, you're pretty well on point. Um, and then there's the tarpouche, the upside down flower pot, one of my favorites. It's not a party until you've got a lampshade on your head. It's the best thing I, I've ever found when it comes to Turkish garments. Um, this one right here, I actually had the pleasure of um, um, going on site um, in, um, oh, Felix's wife's name. I really should have written stuff down, I apologize. There is a Laurel um, out of the middle who um, was referenced previously in one of the pictures. Um, and I had the pleasure of, I had an emergency on site at Penzik and I missed her class when she was teaching how to make these on site. And she let me sit in her pavilion and we built one together on site at Penzik. It was one of the coolest SEA experiences of my life. Um, and, you know, when you're relatively young in the SEA, if you ever get the chance to just sit at the feet of a Laurel who's teaching you something, do so. Um, and then, of course, you know, a couple of different other varieties of hats. And moving along. Oh, Drat, I thought I had. I thought I had. Oh, oh, sorry. I have more headwear on the Finishing Your Middle Eastern Look class handout than I do on this one. So I apologize there wasn't as much headwear on this one. 
um, we're getting into the patterns here. And um, I really lucked out um, in, while I was creating this class, um, I had this class and the other class I'll be teaching this afternoon. Um, I had uh, uh, my twin sister, Mistress Mariana, um, and uh, uh, Duchess Mistress Cecilia, um, as well as um, Mistress Sabia, take a look at you know what I was building, and you know get their advice and review everything, make sure all the I's were dotted and T's were crossed, right? Um, and Sabia introduced me to this wonderful, amazing lady right here. Her ladyship, um, Isa, um, and I think I pronounced that correctly. We've tried to compare pronunciations online. It's not as helpful. But um, she literally recreated um, the um, uh, Persian um, patterning that um, uh, 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 Roxane Farabi, who is now... Um, uh, her Grace Ethel Drada. She has actually changed personas, sadly. Um, but uh, uh, Roxanne and um, oh, good gravy. Who? Hold for just a second here. I actually want to share this with you guys. Can you see that? I don't know if you can. Yes. Good. Sometimes, sometimes if you share just the application, it gets kind of cranky about what you want to share. That's that's the other name I needed. Um, Baroness Rosalind. Um, worked very heavily um, with Roxane during, you know, the heyday of the Persian University. Um, and um, uh, Isa, Isa um, recreated this, not only recreated the handout, but more importantly, she literally made a Persian pattern coat generator. It is the coolest damn thing I have ever seen in my life. You plug your measurements into this Excel spreadsheet that she built, and it's going to tell you exactly what measurements you need to create your garment. Coolest thing ever. Brilliant use of technology. Um, and then, of course, there's the, the good old standby reconstructing history. Um, that pattern can be difficult to use. Both any of their patterns can be difficult to use. The instructions are not great, um, but the patterns are accurate, correct, and they're great for somebody who just wants something off the shelf. Um, then I also included uh, Mistress Ari Ushni. Um, she is a Middle Eastern laurel out of Aitenbelt. Um, she created, pardon me, um, some 15th and 16th century Turkish clothing patterns. Um, something really interesting about um, her patterns that I want to point out is um, she has a very, um, uh, there's a garment that is researched very limitedly. Um, called the Mintan. It's actually Armenian um, in nature. And uh, the reason it's very limited in the research is because um, all that they've been able to find are um, extant pieces that were children's garments. But this is literally a um, waist length coat with um, super long sleeves. Not really sure their purpose, you know, but I wanted to point out that that pattern is in her handout. And then we've also got Master of Themes, good old Ottoman pattern. I've included links to all of my favorite um, sources. Um, so you guys can just literally like go through and look at whatever it is that you want to look at. Um, I have to say that obviously the Met is an amazing resource for just about anything you want to research, but they've got some really great um, Middle Eastern uh, information. Obviously, the Top Copy Palace Museum. Beautiful part about one of the most amazing things about the pandemic is the fact that all of the all of the museums opened up their catalog, which was amazing because the ability to just look at what's available out there whenever you want without having to travel halfway across the world, pretty amazing. Um, the iTurchy Codex um, is, I, I, I want to point something out. Um, this is used very heavily um, in um, uh, documentation for um, Ottoman Turkish, but these um, these illustrations were done by um, an Italian ambassador. 
So please keep in mind as you're looking at these illustrations for, and they're still great for documentation, but keep in mind that there is a, a, a slightly Western viewpoint in some of these illustrations. Um, the Turkish, Turkish Cultural Foundation is really fabulous. Um, all sorts of incredible images in there. Um, some really unique pieces that you can't find anywhere else. Um, there, I found um, another um, uh, Turkish top copy extant pieces um, catalog that not a lot of people um, kind of dig into. It's really fabulous, kind of separates everything out a little bit um, easier to click through than, um, than the actual top copy museum. Um, there's those talismanic shirts there for me. <laughs> um, and then, um, of course, um, a couple of Persian um, pieces um, or links. Um, the Style and Status exhib Exhibition is incredible. Um, if you get a chance to click through, I highly suggest. Um, all of these are really great. Um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Sources. Um, for inspiration and just looking at extant pieces or miniatures or, you know, art, metalwork, pottery of the time to just give you a sense of, of the period. And then, of course, I'm also going to plug my blog. Not as great as all the rest of these, but, you know, I wanted to let you guys know it's out there. Various really important books. And I'm not going to stay on here because you guys are all going to get this handout. And the merchants. So um, I really, really want to give a huge amount of props to um, Silver Tree Souk. Um, she, um, she is a very um, popular uh, merchant um, out at uh, Penzik. She doesn't usually make it out to the side of the country, uh, but if you ever get a chance to go to Penzik, I highly recommend going into her booth. Um, she is currently working online. Um, her garments are not cheap. Um, but they are silk, um, so and she is doing a huge amount of incredible block printing right now, um, so you get what you pay for. Um, she also um, gave me permission to utilize a lot of her photos um, in here because the the recreations that she's making are really fantastic. Um, of course, we've got our favorite Raymond. Um, he's got some really incredible belt mounts. Um, he's got a huge variety of huge, there's like five or six, but that's a lot for Persian. Um, he's got a huge variety of belt mounts, which are really, really um, a, a great way to kind of your look. Um, Jotty's um, Silk Road Etsy shop is, um, is a great um, resource. Jotty herself is an amazing resource. If you ever get a chance to spend some time with her, um, we have a very special relationship and that she's married to my ex-husband. Um, so, and I introduced them. Um, we've been friends for a very, very long time. Um, she, she's an incredible person and a wealth of knowledge. Um, of course, shoes, one of my favorite topics ever. And the most amazing shoe person in the entire SBA, in my opinion, Bobo. Um, so this last, um, merchant, oops, hang on. I want to talk about specifically. I have worn coats from Griffin's Gate for literally 20 years. Um, uh, Griffin's Gate would come out to Australia. I think she made it out to a couple of Battlemores. Um, she goes out to Penzik. Um, she is working to get an online presence, but she does not have one. Um, I cannot recommend her garment highly enough. And the reason I say that is that I'm still wearing coats that I bought 20 years ago. And I have beat them to death. Um, I will state that her coats are typically made out of um, uh, her, her grand coats are made with um, brocade that are lined in cotton and her um, Antari or her middle layer coats are generally made out of um, a high quality cotton. Um, so, you know, they're not silk by any means of the word, but they do the job. 
Um, and they're reasonably priced for what you get, especially considering the fact that you can literally wear these garments for 20 years. I have worn, I, I think I have two coats still in my um, voluminous closet rack that's currently in the garage um, that I bought 20 years ago that I wear all the time. And we beat our clothes up in the SCA. So, you know, when you're talking about garments that you've worn for that long, pretty damn impressive. Um, I want to note that, um, again, she's working to get online, but um, she is currently only doing business through um, Facebook Messenger. And it may take you three weeks to get a response. The reason behind that is that um, Beth and um, her, I believe she married him, husband Rock, um, are up on the mountain in San Diego, outside of um, San Diego proper. And they have no internet whatsoever up on the mountain. She has to come into town to even read her messages. So um, I'm going to tell you to contact her because her garments are amazing. Um, and she will happily send you all sorts of pictures of what she's got available. Um, but it might take you a while. And I believe that's it. I'm gonna um, thank several people. Um, I got contributions, of course, from uh, Mistress Ari, um, Master Asim, um, Mistress Sophia, and of course, again, Silver Tree Souk. And then I wanted to thank um, Sabia, Cecilia, and Mariana for um, doing the reviewing and editing on this. So, I know I blathered through a lot in about 45 minutes. Um, I intentionally wanted to keep this class um, a little bit shorter than an hour, um, simply because you always want to make room for questions. Um, and I um, also wanted to, you know, make sure that I got through everything and didn't leave you guys hanging. So, we're done a little bit early. Does anybody have any questions? Have you done any research on uh, the talismanic shirts? Um, I've done enough just to get me into trouble, I think, which is not much. All right. I think I'm 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 very much in the same boat. Um, I um, I also have the reason I was I was so excited about the talismanic shirts. I mean, aside from the fact that they're cool as hell, um, is that I also um, do um, uh, calligraphy and illumination. Um, and I did, you know, I, I need to dig up my research, but I do have, you know, some ideas about the pigments that they use, um, some of the different patterns that they use. Somewhere in my research, I've got a, a bunch of different pictures of all of the different ones that I could find because, God, there's a lot of a lot of them. I don't know how they, out of everything else, I don't know how they existed and stuck around for so long because they were a skin layer garment to protect the wearer. I, it, it blows my mind that there's so many XM pieces still available. Like I've seen probably eight, eight or nine of them, different different talismanic shirts. Um, and I, I don't think I've blogged about those. I need to. I need to pull out my, my research file and be like, I need to put all of these out there. Um, but I think I've done kind of the same thing you have, which is done just enough research to get myself in trouble and be like. I want to do this thing, but it's going to take me forever. <laughs> I don't know if I can do that thing. I'm so, such an instant gratification girl. <laughs> so I think they're a little late for me. Uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, because don't you do, do, do you do, if I remember correctly, are you Seljuk or Mamluk? Um, I do early 13th century, basically Seljuk, although I'm Syrian. But, you know, yeah. ser serving the Seljuk, so when, when in Rome, dressed as a Seljuk. Um, right. So they're a bit early, but I suspect that there there's a, a, a continuity between the the brass bands mm -hmm. and the talismanic shirts. I I, I don't. Uh, yeah. I'm all, my, right. all, all my Middle Eastern garbs packed right now, but uh, um, right. But uh, so I I love the terraz bands. I think they're fantastic. I think they're really cool. But um, right. I think there's there's because about the time they disappear, you start to see the the, the beginnings of the, the talismanic shirt. So there's got to be a tie there. 
I, I think you I think you're probably on the right path. I mean, it, it's now that I think about it, you're absolutely right. Like I hadn't even connected the dots on that, but it definitely, you know, you stop seeing the presence and all of a sudden there's this like huge emergence of talismanic shirts. So definitely a possibility. Um, I want to mention, especially to you, but to everybody on the call that um, I actually just discovered that um, Spoonflower is doing um, this incredible, there's like, I think probably 10 different pieces of Taraz fabric. Oh, yeah. So, um, I don't know if anybody's seen that, but I'm like, I got to buy like everything. Um, my husband, of course, is like, could you just make sure this doesn't say I'm an asshole, please, before you buy it? Um, <laughs> because, of course, you know, you never know when you're looking at, you know, another language, right? You want to make sure that you're not like, this honky's a jerk, like, wearing the Middle Eastern stuff, what the hell, right? Like, and it's on your arm that way. Um, so you want to make sure that, you know, you've got the right stuff. But, I mean, there's, I saw bands like this wide. I've seen, I saw bands like this wide. And, like, you can get one yard of fabric and have Taraz bands for the rest of your life. Yeah, pretty so much. So they just... Uh, and there's so many different variations of them. I stumbled on them the other day just looking for fabric, and I was like, oh, it's, oh look, easy button. <laughs> I've, made, uh, I've made several blocks of, the, pretty much every time I find a terrace that, that repeats, that, that mm -hmm. block, I've made a block for it, so I have probably about seven or eight different ones. Um, Hello. Countess, uh, Countess, um, Oh God, Claudia actually had me print some up for her um, that she that she sells um, in oh. her, in her booth. So there's a few nice. that that uh, she sells. And but um, where was I going with this? Oh, this, but back to the spoon flower. So I'd seen them, but but what actually caught my attention more was the ottoman tent panels. <laughs> <laughs> they're so beautiful. Yes, they are. The food flower stuff that's been coming out is just astonishing. Um, yeah. And did everybody see this? Um, and I'm going to butcher her name, but um, uh, Coxable, um, God, where's she out of? Is she out of Meridier? Um, I needed to, I, I probably needed to include her Etsy shop on my vendors list. I'll update the, the, the presentation and include her shop. But she's doing um, uh, block printing out of India with all of the, um, uh, a lot of the peerage um, motifs. Oh. Uh, uh, yeah, I specifically was like, hi, could you do a bunch of green and gold? That'd be great. She was like, but I wanted to keep the pelicans white because of, of heraldry. And I was like, no, gold pelicans on, on green. Thanks. So, but she has her Etsy shop is amazing. She's got tons of different fabulous fabrics. Um, I'm actually waiting for my doorbell to ring for my latest fabric board for her to come in. Um, but she's got some really all of, almost all of her stuff is is you know Indian block print um, cotton. Mm -hmm. um, but she's got stuff that you just don't see anywhere else, which is really nifty. I need to include her on here, and I'll do that before I send it out. So when you guys were talking about shirts, there's actually a master species that came out of Turkey in 2018. There are 22 period pieces that are undergarments and it's like they've gone through and they've taken pictures of all the stitching, they've taken pictures of all the, the closures um, and it's, it's all in Turkish, but the picture and Google Translate is my friend, um, but it's gorgeous let me see if i can oh drop that somewhere yeah and it's it's like all the shirts that are yeah give, give me a second and i'll drop it because it's all i saved a copy like in 2018 because like, <laughs> sometimes you're you're you right now are saving me from having to go dig through like binders that i like put together 10 years ago i love you so much right now <laughs> um but best best zoom room moderator ever I really like underwear. 
So go, going back to the uh, terrorism, sorry, the, the talisman, do you know Miss, uh, Mistress uh, Rowan from, I think she's from Atlantia or the East. She's, uh, she does, she's got a lot of information on, uh, on talisman shirt. That's where most, where I, most of my information has come from was from her. Um, she does the, the, the tera, her things are like the tera, the, the tera, I keep saying tera, the talismanic shirts. And then she also does like the, um, she's researched the, I can't remember the name, but they are for the Arabic version of the, the pattern osters. Mm -hmm. So she's a ton of research on, on, well, and on, you know, European pattern osters as well as the, the, uh, the Arabic version, which I can't, uh, that name is escaping me. Right? It's that day for, damn it, I can't remember the name of this thing. I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> but but she's great with, uh, with the talismanic shirt. Because mine, the one for my elevation, actually, it was all quotes from peers that I, that I, uh, that I had asked for. And then they were, they're being, in fact, I don't have, the, I don't even have the tunic right now because the, the lady who was making it's being worked on again. Well, she took it. But she yeah, she took it. She took it back to finish it. It didn't get finished, so they're adding more. <laughs> but it's yeah, it's all. You're so, uh, you so lucky yeah. that people love you that much because that thing is a made ball. It's it is. I am so thrilled with it. Um, I feel like an underwear model when I wear it out. <laughs> 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 But yeah, it's, it's super cool. I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. And I know Aria, Aria is off looking for that, for that link. So, oh, it's in the chat. So oh, did I miss it? I just dropped the file. <laughs> You're welcome, hard one. <laughs> like, am I blind? I don't see it. Can you open the one that says turkishunderwear.pdf in the chat? So it's funny, I'm not actually seeing it in the chat. Um, I wonder if it's because I'm presenting. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be. Maybe. Zoom is so, so challenging. I'm an executive assistant for a living. I've been an executive assistant for like 20 years. Um, and Zoom is like one of the most like rip my hair out <laughs> platforms. Ever. Uh, and I'm really technical tech, technologically savvy. I need more coffee. But yeah, I'm not seeing the file. Um hold on just a minute. Let me see if I can find just a direct link. And what's funny is I can see like where Halima um said off and file thing. Um Oh, yeah, no, no, no file for me. Yeah, it's, oh, it's weird. If you want to, you know, Aria, you've got my email. If you want to just email it to me, I would be, okay. I, I will. really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Could you put your email in the chat and I'll just send it to you right now? Absolutely. It'll come from my work email just because I'm on, on my work machine. No worries. I sincerely appreciate that. All righty. So any other questions before we go and eat some lunch? All righty. Um, so I'm going to let everybody go. I hope I see um, all of you in my 3 o'clock class this afternoon. Uh, Bertana, that's 6 o'clock for you, honey. Um, so hopefully I get to, hopefully, maybe, maybe, Maybe you could just put some makeup and a veil on and I could actually see your face and cry like a little girl. That'd be great. Um, you don't have to, you can ignore me. Um, but it was an absolute joy um, getting to share all of this information with you. If anybody has any questions, my contact information um, is available um, in the, the uh, handout, which again, will come out to you guys after the class. Not sure how the university is managing that, but um, I know that, um, uh, we can request to have it sent out, so I will absolutely do so. Um, and I will also permanently be keeping the documentation. I've already got a draft um, set up for um, the links to documentation for both of my classes on my blog. So if you ever want to go back to it after the fact, it will be there. So 
Awesome. Thank you guys so much. It was such a pleasure. Hopefully I get to see everybody later this afternoon. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. See you later. Thank you.